Rosemary oil. Hey. Rosemary oil. Say. Rosemary oil. Again, I dare you. I double dare you, motherfuckers. Rosemary oil. One more goddamn time. <laughs> Rosemary oil. The answer is no. Rosemary isn't as effective as 2% of minoxidil, and I'll be telling you why you should ignore that study that everyone keeps talking about. The study titled Rosemary Oil versus Minoxidil 2% for the Treatment of Androgenetic Alopecia, a Randomized Comparative Trial by Dr. Yunus Hanai et al. 2015, is so bad I'm not even sure why it became like this propagated on the internet. In this study, 100 patients were randomly assigned to either rosemary oil, patients were assigned to rosemary oil, or 2% topical minoxidil, so another 50 assigned to 2% topical minoxidil. So it's 100 patients split into two groups, 50 and 50. 50 for rosemary oil and 50 for topical minoxidil, 2% topical minoxidil. And the duration of the study went on for six months. Now, there was no control group in this study, and much of the results of this study relies on a patient self-assessment. Now, I'll tell you why shortly this is a major issue. The researchers found no significant difference in hair count between the two groups at three months and six months endpoints. However, both groups experienced a significant increase in hair count at the six-month endpoint compared with the baseline and the three-month endpoint. So you had baseline, three-month, and six-month endpoints. Those are the three endpoints and their baseline is what both groups use to refer to to see if there was any sort of improvement in their hair count. Now, when we get into the limitations of the study, the study relied on self-assessment questionnaires filled out by patients to evaluate the efficacy of rosemary oil and 2% topical minoxidil in treating androgenetic alopecia. Now, while self-assessment questionnaires can provide valuable insights into patients' perceptions of treatment efficacy, they are subject to several biases and limitations. The first being the subjectivity. Patients may not accurately assess the true changes in hair count or quality, leading to biased results. Hair length, for example, may give the illusion of hair growth or more hair being present, which can influence the self-assessment and study overall. I'm looking at these photos in the study, and honestly, they barely look different. I'll give props that the lighting is somewhat the same for both groups. However, the photo they chose to display in both 2% topical minoxidil group and rosemary oil group simply just look as if the patients grew out their hair. We also have recall bias, and this is where the patients might not accurately remember their baseline state of their hair and scalp condition when they started filling out the questionnaires at the later point in time. So they may not really remember how bad or how not so bad their hair loss was when they started out at baseline. And now that they're filling out the questionnaire, they probably think they're doing better. We also have response bias. So patients might be influenced by social disparity or expectations about the treatment's effectiveness, leading them to over or under report changes in their hair condition. This also falls in line with the subject or participation bias, and this is a tendency of patients or subjects in an experiment to consciously or in most cases subconsciously act in a way that they think the experimenter or researcher wants them to act. In addition, there's a lack of blinding and a control group. This study did not include a control group making it difficult to account for the natural progression of androgenetic alopecia and to determine the true effectiveness of both of the treatments compared to no treatment or a placebo. The absence of a control group also prevents the evaluation of the placebo effect. Additionally, the lack of blinding in this study could have influenced patients' self-assessment responses. Rosemary oil, for instance, has a distinct smell, so patients could easily identify that the treatment they were receiving, which may have led them to report benefits based on their perceptions, rather than the actual treatment efficacy. There could be a potential placebo effect, which is the belief that one is getting a benefit from some treatment or intervention, which in turn helps them in some way. In reality, it is the power of suggestion and the mind that contributes to the patient feeling better and not the intervention or treatment. So that's what the placebo effect is. I find this to be a major issue because throughout this study, 
the comparison of rosemary oil and 2% topical minoxidil is stated to have statistically similar effects on hair count. The paper states that, quote, both groups experienced a significant increase in hair count at the six-month endpoint compared with the baseline and three-month endpoint. No significant difference was found between the study groups regarding hair count either at three-month or six-month endpoint, unquote. So let's break this down a bit. Quote, both groups experienced a significant increase in hair count at the six-month endpoint compared with the baseline and three-month endpoint, giving a p-value of less than 0.05, unquote. So that means that for both the rosemary oil group and the 2% topical minoxidil group, there was a statistically significant increase in hair count after six months of treatment compared to the baseline or the start of the study and the three-month endpoint. The p-value being less than 0.05 indicates that this increase is unlikely to have occurred by chance and it is considered statistically significant. So pretty much the paper is suggesting that it was not chance alone that 2% topical minoxidil and rosemary oil grew the hair of the subjects. To further simplify what I said, the study is saying that it was rosemary oil and 2% topical minoxidil that grew the hair of the subject. That, that's what the study is, is saying. Now let's break down the other half of the quote. Quote, no significant difference was found between the study groups regarding hair count either at month 3 or month 6, with the p-value greater than 0.05, unquote. This means that when comparing the rosemary oil group to the 2% topical minoxidil group, there was no statistically significant difference in hair count at the 3-month and 6-month time points. The p-value being greater than 0.05 indicates that any observed differences between the two groups could have occurred by chance. So what the paper here is also saying is that there is not enough evidence to support the idea that one treatment is more effective than the other in terms of hair count at these time points. So it's saying that 2% topical minoxidil is just as effective as rosemary oil. That's pretty much where this entire claim came from. But again, there was no control group. Also, not to mention, how are they counting the hairs exactly? Maybe I missed it, but there is no mention of a use of a photo trichogram. And for those of you who don't know, this is a tool that's used to help take up close pictures of the skin at a consistent magnification within the scope of a particular measurement of the skin. When the researchers refer to hair count, they immediately show a picture of some dude's hair. Nothing up close proving the change in hair count. So this was a bit of a weird part of the study. And finally, small sample size. This study involved only 100 patients, which is a relatively small sample size. Now, a small sample size can negatively affect the reliability, viability, and generalizability of a study's findings, leading to a higher risk of drawing incorrect conclusion or overlooking true effects. To address these issues, researchers should aim to use a larger sample size whenever possible, which can help improve statistical power, representativeness, and precision of their studies. A large sample size would have allowed for a more robust assessment of the treatment's efficacy and strengthened the study design. So, to conclude, while the study on the clinical efficacy of rosemary oil in the treatment of androgenetic alopecia provides some evidence of its effectiveness compared to minoxidil 2%, the limitations discussed warrant caution when interpreting the results. Further research employing more rigorous methodologies and addressing the limitations of this study is needed to provide clear understanding of the true efficacy of rosemary oil and minoxidil 2% in treating androgenetic alopecia. This will not only enhance the scientific rigor of the findings, but also help clinicians and patients in making more informed decisions about 
the most appropriate treatments for androgenetic alopecia. Several limitations, including the use of self-assessment questionnaires, the lack of a control group, the absence of blinding, a small sample size, and an unclear hair count assessment methodology make it difficult to draw definitive conclusions about the true efficacy of the treatments, specifically rosemary oil. We have tons of studies on topical minoxidil, 2%, 5%, even at 15%, proving its efficacy. So future research should address these limitations for rosemary oil studies compared to minoxidil studies um, by employing a more rigorous study design, including a control group, that's the most important one, blinding, and maybe a larger sample size and also clear standardized methodology for hair count assessment. Because with this study, it's been propagating so many false narratives about rosemary oil being just as effective as 2% minoxidil or even more effective than 2% minoxidil, when in reality, it's based off of a very flawed study design, which is very suspect because the so-called claims about the minoxidil in this study, at uh, 2% minoxidil in this study, somehow in this study, 2% minoxidil grew less hair than in other studies as well. So it seems a bit off. This study seems like an outlier, and I don't understand how a PhD and his team uh, could make such a poorly designed study, which a lot of people seem to be taking at face value, which is not good. So if you want my opinion, my verdict, don't fuck with that rosemary oil shit and assume that it's going to grow your hair. Use it as some sort of means to control your scalp condition, maybe treat dryness or something like that. But it's not going to grow your damn hair. Stick to minoxidil. If you're not a responder to minoxidil, you know, put tretinoin on your scalp then 10 minutes later apply minoxidil and the sulfur transferase enzyme will turn that minoxidil to minoxidil sulfate and grow your, your damn follicles, right? And then take your finasteride, which I didn't do this morning and I'm recording this video, so I'll do that right now. But anyway, thanks for watching this video and I hope to see you guys in the next one. Peace out.